panel, uh, your resident goofball right here, Jane Huger, uh, serious news anchor John Iderola, uh, Jessica Burbank is taken into the bank at Rebel <laughs> headquarters and on the main show. Okay, <laughs> so uh, do we have a fantastic show for you guys? Of course. Uh, are there super important and serious stories? Yes. Will we analyze it better than anyone else? Of course. But uh, we also have a set of hilarious stories peppered throughout the show. Okay, mm -hmm. there's no salt uh, on today's show, but there is pepper. Okay, yes. so I, I, I'm going to do a very rare tease of a members only uh, story, the funniest story of the year. It's a, it's for the members. It's happening today, the funniest story of the year. But we also have a super interesting story later that is not political. It's a little tiny bit political, but should you dump your girlfriend over student debts? Drama. Just in case, okay, so already did. <laughs> okay, I'm not taking any chances. Hey, look. No, look, Johnny Pie, always thinking, <laughs> always thinking. Okay, so uh, all right. Without further ado, uh, let's do some politics. Okay, we don't have any time for any more ado. So everyone, prepare to hear the most divisive speech in American political history. Starting with this: Equality and democracy are under assault. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. Now that speech that you're hearing from President Biden can mean different things to you depending on who you are. If you're a member of the mainstream media or pretty much any right wing political commentator, what you heard right there was indecipherable. It was just swears and slurs and that's it. It was unacceptable. It certainly wasn't anything that was gonna unify us. If you're a regular person, he was acknowledging truths that we've all come to understand four or five years ago at this point. But anyway, he also made clear there that the comments he was making were about the most extreme end of the MAGA movement, not regular Republicans. I think he was honestly being too fair, too generous to them. But that said, he did have more warning to do. Take a look at this. The Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people, and they're working right now. As I speak in state after state to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards, backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, no right to contraception, no right to marry who you love. They spread fear and lies, lies told for profit and power. Now, all of that is true, especially indicating there that they do it for profit, whether on the media side or the political side, they're doing it for their own ends. Um, but what he said there about what they want to accomplish is true. They do want to strip away those rights. That's just, he's not making this up. He's not speculating. This isn't a hypothesis. This is what they're doing out every day. And in terms of their threat to democracy, uh, how many Republicans acknowledge the results of the 2020 election? How many candidates on the Republican side this year accept the results of their elections, even inside of just Republican primaries? How many candidates for secretaries of state or county elections boards officers are not being positioned there simply so that they can give Donald Trump a better chance of overturning the results of the next election? All of this is abundantly clear. It's important that people understand it. But the media is going to be just so freaked out by the fact that a president would say it that I wonder how much of the, the honest meaning there is actually going to be absorbed by most people. But what do you think? Yeah, so uh, first of all, it's really amazing that there are three versions of this speech. So one version of the speech is um, right wing media and corporate media. They, they're again united and uh, going like, oh my. God, look at dark Brandon lasering those poor, poor Republicans. What is he doing? What a monster, right? I'm like, wait, did, did we see the same speech? <laughs> okay, so they're like, how can he say that the Republicans are a threat to democracy? Uh, I don't know, January 6th when they raided the American Capitol. Uh, but more importantly, when they had a scheme of fake electors where they would do a coup and end our democracy. 
maybe that was a dead giveaway that they were trying to end democracy. But why are they doing that? Okay, right wing media you get and we'll talk more about them because they're hilarious. Their overreaction is just the funniest thing in the world later in the show, okay? But mainstream media, mainly CNN, oh, they're in a cold sweat panic. John Harwood just got fired, okay? And and his last segment on CNN was, yeah, Republicans are a threat to democracy. And they're like, get him off there, get him off there. CNN has a new Republican owner. He's taking this personally. So I've now seen half a dozen segments on CNN. Biden is being way too mean and offensive. Can you believe what Biden is saying? Calling them semi-fascists. I can't believe it. Oh, please don't fire me. Please, new Republican <laughs> owner, please don't fire me. Okay. I got it, Brianna Killar, almost all of them, John Allen, all of them, all of them, all of them. They're all begging for their jobs by kissing Republican ass on air now. So CNN, bye Felicia, it was nice knowing you. Okay, so now the reality of the speech is, look, I liked it. And I wanna give Biden credit because it's rare when a politician does the right thing, let alone, and the more powerful the politician is, the more rare it is that they'll do the right thing. And and Biden is, is looks strong. I, I'm shocked to report that. Shocked to report it, but he kind of does. So is he really dark, Brandon? Are you kidding me? Look at what he said there. It's still for us now the real world. It's still soft. He said, "No, MAGA Republicans are not a majority of Republicans." Absurd. According to the polling, they're 95 percent of Republicans. But whoever is the genius behind the scenes that convinced Joe Biden that MAGA is only 25% of the Republican Party, thank you, thank you. Otherwise, he would have never criticized them because he loves Republicans so much. Even in that speech, he's like, no, the majority of Republicans are awesome. I love those Republicans, the majority of Republicans, yeah. And even that was, by the way, too partisan and harsh for CNN, right? No, the reality is, no, MAGA's the entire Republican Party. So he should be making this speech about the entirety of the party, but I'll take it, I'll take it. So it's not really dark Brandon and we joke around about that. It's more like off white Brandon, just a little, <laughs> a little darker than what we normally get. Yeah, I love the dark Brandon rhetoric. I am deep in the memes on Twitter, but I wanna zoom out for a second. If we look at the progress we made following the civil rights movement in the 60s, we really saw a growth in civil rights being observed and reflected in law in the United States. And for many white supremacists, this felt like oppression. Them losing their privilege or the prospect of equality was something that they really hated. And a lot of them took to right wing extremism, fell into the demagoguery of Trump, and they still follow him today. And in a similar vein, I would say they have been privileged to have Biden be so weak, to not have him calling it what it is when it's fascism, when it's a threat to democracy, when the Dems have been so weak. Now that they are finally just telling basic truth, that's truths about what is going on in in our country, which Biden did multiple times in this speech, which is something that we've all been asking him to do on the Young Turks for quite some time. You know, we have to call that a win, but it's not really Biden being amazing. As Jenk said, it's it's off white Brandon, not dark Brandon. It's him doing the bare minimum, which is something to celebrate at this point, because for so long we've had the Dems being so weak and not calling the rise of fascism in the United States precisely what it is. 100%. 100%. Yeah, I think so. And actually, I we're critiquing what, the truth of Dark Brand, and I have one extra critique I want to lodge. But um, but first, I want to turn to a part of the speech that's really not going to be acknowledged at all. Everyone is, of course, focusing on him attacking the Republicans, but much of the speech was him attempting to appeal to people's hopes for the future, optimism for the future, as well as sketching out what he has already accomplished. But let's go to a little bit more of the uh, the positive part of the speech. America's often made the greatest progress coming out of some of our darkest moments like you're hearing that bullhorn. I believe we can and must do that again. We're gonna create millions of new jobs in a clean energy economy. We're gonna think big, we're going to make the 21st century another American century because the world needs us to. That's where we need to focus our energy. Not in the past, not on divisive culture wars, not on the politics of grievance, but on a future we can build together. Okay, so that part of the speech was about unity, and it's a part that every single Republican in the country is gonna pretend that they just they couldn't hear it. They just they could not process that as speech for some reason.
But honestly, what I would like to see is a melding of the two parts. So you have the part where he's going hard at the Republicans as a threat to democracy, a group that wants to strip away these rights. And then you have him saying, no, we can have a better future. Well, what if to get to that better future, we need to actually do more, not just in criticizing the Republicans, but doing something about it. You know, if they're trying to make it so that people can't vote or strip away their reproductive rights or make it so they can't marry who they want, then you as you know, an avatar of political power in the executive branch of the government need to do something about that. And the Democrats need to back you up. And if the Democrats aren't gonna do that, as they very often during your first term haven't been willing to do, then now is a time to use those laser eyes, not in the way that is easy, tough for Biden, but easy once they're deployed, which is to go after Trump. That's relatively easy to do. Turn the laser eyes at those in your own party who are obstructing it. If you want to accomplish these things and you need to get past the filibuster, or at least carve out areas, then turn it on them. He's not naming those names. Dark Brandon is like full of power and all that, but not enough to actually go after Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. That's what we need. He's strong in comparison to Biden of three months ago, but he's still not actually combative against the people who are doing the most single-handed work to uh, you know hamstring his agenda going forward. Yeah, John, last couple of quick points here. First, uh, on your point, I mean, look, let's keep it real. Uh, factually speaking, he's done about 15% of his agenda, which I, I give him credit that uh, it's probably about three times what Obama did. Um, Obama's king of 5% change. Uh, but the establishment is making it seem like he did 115% of his agenda. No, he, he didn't even do 15 million rights. He didn't even do voting rights, it was a bare, bare, bare minimum. So like, hey, I like student debt relief. I give credit where credit is due, etc. But it was a tiny percent of his agenda. Does he really want to do that agenda? No, he's still the same corporate Biden, right? I'm not going to get enamored by a political speech and think, oh my God, he's so strong. No, he's never going to fight against the corporate Democrats that are actually blocking his so-called agenda, which he actually likes it being blocked, basically, right? So none of those things have changed at all. But the rhetoric has changed. And when it comes to politics, especially electoral politics, with the elections coming up in two months, rhetoric matters. It makes a big difference in how people vote. So here, I'll give you a perfect example, which is this speech and what Biden has been saying lately. So when he called them semi-fascist, he played offense. What did that? What what happened next? It forced the Republicans to cry about it. And then it forced the rest of the media to cover it because Republicans are crying. So all that anybody heard for the last couple of weeks is semi-fascist, semi-fascist, semi-fascist. And then now the question it isn't should I vote for Republicans or not? The question is, are Republicans semi-fascist or a quarter fascist or fully fascist? That's the question you want. That's why you play offense. So and in this case, um, he gives a speech. And what is everybody talking about today in, in mainstream news? Is Biden too tough? You love that conversation if you're the Democrats. Is the head of our party too strong? <laughs> Come on, that's why you play offense and it works, right? So don't get seduced into thinking Biden did most of his agenda. He most certainly did not, right? But this is good politics, finally. And speaking of finally, Uriah Heap writes in our member section, become a member, be part of the show, tyt.com slash join. Anyway, just a thought, Jank Uger, speechwriter for Biden, you would see the political universe explode. And that is certainly true, and and it's not just me. You give him a strong progressive writer, and all we'll do is play offense, and all these guys will be crying all day long about how the Democrats are too strong, they get too much done for the American people. Uh, and and we all we would do is win, okay? We'd get tired of winning. Yeah, rhetoric is good. Actually executing on the agenda that you ran on is even better. And I saw a yes. really funny post online that was like, you know, I Bidened all throughout college where I didn't really do much, but then I crushed the midterm. <laughs> and I would love to see Biden crush the midterm and continue to pass things that he ran on. And he spent a lot of this speech talking about threats to our democracy, voting rights, how people are being put in positions of power in Republican states to potentially overturn elections. But I remember back in August 2020 when he was on the campaign trail giving a speech to the Teamsters Union where he said it is just as serious when people bust unions and jeopardize union elections 
as it is when they do that to democratic elections for public office. And Labor Day is Monday. Now would be a really good time to send a strong message to all of the people union busting across the country. Exactly, yeah. You know what, actually, I'm glad that you brought that up. Because Cenk, you were talking about how rhetoric is important. This is a great opportunity with the midterms coming up. Rhetoric is important and perceptions are important. And as we've started to talk about in the past couple of weeks, the fact that Biden is actually doing a few things has really changed not just the way that we feel about this term, but what's possible going forward. It's making us sort of reevaluate what might be done. And it's producing a little bit of fun online. Let's go to the last video and you'll see an example of what I'm talking about. Is this unfair to people who paid their student loans or chose not to take out loans? Is it fair to people who in fact uh, do not own multi-billion dollar businesses if she wants these guys getting all attacked tax things. Is that fair? What do you think? Okay, so look, if if the memes haven't already been ruined, they will soon be ruined by bad people. But for now, it is fun. And behind the memes is a truth. More more important than just the irony that led to Dark Bread in the first place. Now it's well, maybe he could keep this going. Maybe if he gets a taste of people actually thinking that he's tough, that he can accomplish something, maybe that will inspire him to do more going forward. And so I'm just curious what you all think about like in three months, are we gonna even remember that this happened? Is it gonna feel totally unearned? Or is he going to find other small things that he can occasionally dole out to keep the sense of enthusiasm or optimism going? Yeah, no. Uh, so first of all, I love that clip. That's my favorite Biden clip of all time. If we had that <laughs> Biden, then I'd be much more enthused, right? Uh, but he doesn't really mean it. Uh, he'll go back to giving multi-billion billionaires tax cuts and tax deals and loopholes uh, after the midterms. I'm just keeping it real, okay? So now, on the other hand, John's right. Like when he's tough and it works and he goes up in the uh, polling. That affects him because every politician wants to be popular, needs to be popular in order to win, etc. When he did the student debt relief, and they were super nervous about that, and as we predicted, it worked. It's made them more popular. They're like, whoa! So those things do matter, and they care about it. But at the end of the day, John, if we're being honest, and that's what we do on DYD, after the elections are over. Uh, when he goes to do the rest of his so-called agenda, if they keep the House and the Senate, uh, which are still big ifs, um, the lobbyists will come in and go, you're not gonna raise the minimum wage, you're not gonna give people health care, you're not gonna lower drug prices. And they'll give them millions and millions and millions of dollars to corporate Democrats and Biden, uh, and also Biden, and Biden will uh, not pass any of those things. Yeah, I think Biden leaning into the dark Brandon thing as an online strategy to get the youth vote out in the midterms and in 2024 for the Dems is is smart, right? Young people love videos like that. They're all over TikTok. But I think Jenk is right because people are in tune with the fact that the Democrats have been saying things that are generally good, things that a lot of young people agree with, but haven't been doing much. And so it's got to be paired with an effective online strategy of Biden calling out corruption and hypocrisy. And I really like that in this speech, he called out the Republicans as lying for power and for profit. The fact that he used the word profit is huge there. But he can't just call out corruption. He can't just say good things. He's got to also do things in tandem with that. Yeah, yeah. And imagine how much more powerful it would be if he would acknowledge the corruption on the Democratic side as well. Um, but uh, look, we want to get into the right wing reaction of the speech, but I think we should probably take our first break because there's a lot of crying to summarize on the other side. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thank you, John Adorola, Jessica Burbank, uh, Troy Lavelle, uh, Richard Lander, Jen K Comedy, Devin Giddens. Look at all those people who just joined. They hit that join button be below. That join button below the video on YouTube. Oh, beautiful. Oh, beautiful. You should check it out. Uh, you know what else is beautiful? TYT.com slash join. You guys make this show possible. I love you guys. 
And uh, apparently there's some love back because I'll do one comment from YouTube members. Smokey Eyes wrote in, John is so damn hot. WTF? Yes. These are just facts. Instead of John, <laughs> we're gonna go with Dark Jared. That's gonna be your new. Do I have to be a Jared? <laughs> it was the first J I name I soon. came up with, John. No, <laughs> I, no, let's, no. let's iterate on it, let's okay. iterate on it. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought you said uh, Dark Darren. And I was like, oh, I could see that being John's alter ego. Mm. Uh, that could work. I need some laser Hashtag eyes. Hashtag Dark Darren. Let's work on it. Yeah. All right. But let's do the stories. Okay, let's do that. Um, but uh, I, I do have some bad news for you. I know America is currently suffering uh, from out of control flooding. Well, get ready to be deluged by conservative tears as we launch into this. That is a video. Where Biden, of course, is Hitler, if you're not understanding the historic reference there, that was chaired by Marjorie Greene. Marjorie Greene, of course, is a part of the Republican Party, a party that is spending all of today saying that declaring them semi fascists or a potential threat to democracy is out of bounds, but turning Joe Biden into Hitler. And spreading that on social media is apparently fully acceptable. Um, that's, that doesn't honestly even stand out from other right wingers. They are losing their ever loving minds over this Biden speech. Here's a little mashup for you. That the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. Yeah, they're a threat, says the guy with the blood red Nazi background and Marines standing behind him. The imagery there was almost satanic with that blood red lighting and the two Marines behind him. It was just insane. The idea he would give such a massively partisan speech that degraded half of the country in the eyes of the world. I don't know any Democrat that can stand by that and say that that was OK. So what this speech is easily the most disgraceful speech from a president in recent decades. It is horrifying how he is issuing a call to war mm -hmm. against every single American who didn't vote for him. President Biden tonight gave the speech of a dictator in the style of a dictator, in the visual of a dictator, using the words of a dictator. This was his enemies of the state speech. And like every other radical Marxist tyrant, he accused his opponents of being fascist while he engages in repressive authoritarian behavior. I think that baby Voldemort's got a good point there. Um, no, it's ridiculous. If, if it sounds like they did not listen to the same speech as you, it's because they didn't listen to the speech. Let's be very clear about that. They weren't actually responding to it. Tucker Carlson, you know, while he's up next to me, uh, let off his show saying, we're gonna dive deep into Biden's speech. And then went more than half of the runtime, not playing a single second of it. He had thoughts about it, but he literally was not watching it. It was being broadcast while he was live, and yet he had many thoughts about the speech that he wasn't actually listening to. These are, of course, all right wing commentators that sat happily by for all of these debate performances, campaign speeches, and rallies from Donald Trump, mocking the physically disabled, pitching all Democrats as horrible people, and then not just doing, not just saying things, but doing things, actually working to strip away rights, putting religious ideologues on the Supreme Court, having as your only domestic infrastructure goal the creation of a multi billion dollar wall to keep out the people you label illegals casually. So spare me, honestly, the supposed tears. Stephen Miller would have loved every bit of that if it had been delivered by Trump. It just wouldn't have had any of the sting of actually identifying a true threat to democracy in that case. Yeah, I think half the people in those clips um, uh, know, of course, that they're playing games. And and uh, and Stephen Miller uh, said one thing that is true. He said, look, the oldest trick uh, for people who want to be authoritarian is to call their opponents what they are, which is ironically exactly what he was doing in that appearance. He was an integral part of Donald Trump's presidency, and he pushed a fake elector scheme, which would have literally done a coup against our democracy. He pushes for an authoritarian leader in Donald Trump, and then he says, "Oh, look, Biden's doing it." 
And then he tells you his own strategy as if Biden believes it, right? So that was really meta. Um, but I think half of them guys are genuinely shocked. And and I yeah. and I know why. Because right wingers have a sense of entitlement in this country. The Democrats and the left are not allowed to fight back. That they could say anything they want about Democrats. They could say that they're child molesters and they're uh, baby killers and criminals and rapists and the worst. They could say anything, the most outrageous things about Democrats. But if a Democrat ever says anything about Republicans, they go, oh my God, they have offended half the country. Well, how about when you were calling half the country baby killers and and all the other unbelievable things you've said over the last 40 years. They feel like, no, 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 I have a right to do that. I have a right to punch you in the face. But you don't ever have a right to talk back to me because I'm in charge. Yep. Now, super sad day for the right wing. No, you're not. We do get to talk back to you. You're not the boss of us. And, and they've gotten smug and used to that entitlement. Because Democrats have not fought back in 40 goddamn years. When Biden half fights back, it says, no, no, but you majority of Republicans are wonderful people. The majority of Republicans, my ass, they're wonderful people. They're awful people, right? But he says the majority are good. But less than half are, you know, are problematic because they just try to overturn our democracy. And they're like, this is the most divisive speech in decades. You never saw Donald Trump's speech? They're just amazing. It's amazing to watch them try and brand run of the mill neoliberal democracy as fascism, which might be something that would be kind of easy to do if we were living in a country where most people were to the left of neoliberal democracy. But when we have actual fascists on the far right, by comparison, it's not so easy to do. But I bet people will watch these news segments, not watch the speech and just believe them at their word. And that's really scary. Uh, it's not really about the lighting in the speech. They're trying to frame Biden as an authoritarian leader because he says he's going to uphold elections and, and make sure that public resources sometimes go to things that benefit people and sometimes regulate corporations. And to us on the actual left that want to see the actual will of the people reflected in their government, the speech doesn't go far enough. And that's very clear. And it's very run of the mill neoliberal democracy to the point that he's still calling the United States a democratic experiment and we're the country that's a beacon on the hill. Uh, and he makes a point to very clearly call out political violence, which is, is the same rhetoric that they pushed during the Black Lives Matter movement. We know that in the United States, we've had a lot of one-sided state violence. And when people stand up to that, uh, things like the destruction of property is framed as terribly violent revolutionary behavior. When in reality, it's a response to people being murdered by the state. So Biden's speech was not terribly far right. It was pretty much down the middle, calling for unity by just saying, you know, we need to actually have fair elections, not making any big, bold promises other than to transition to renewable energy, but that wasn't really backed with any details of the plan. So it's insane to watch them brand this speech as extremist when it is the most purely centrist thing yeah. I've heard in a long time. Yeah, and, and when we when we respond with like, have they been listening to Donald Trump? You might come away if you haven't been following every step along the way that, oh, so they're saying that I, I guess everybody does it. That's very clearly not what we're saying. What Biden is doing is not throwing substance free slurs at the other side. He's identifying the actual intent of this movement on the right. They do want to end democracy, perhaps not via coup next time, that would be nice. Um, but they definitely want your vote to not actually count for anything, even less than it does now. That is actually true. When Donald Trump stands on the stage and uh, appeals to the QAnon crowd or you know, has his crowd chant lock her up about conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton. That is not the same thing as accurately describing what a political movement is trying to accomplish. So this is not what aboutism. They are very different things. Um, but I want to give you just a couple more responses to it. It came not just on Fox News. Um, ben Shapiro, he who has always been a very big critic of Trump when he goes too far, uh, tweeted. 
That was the most demagogic, outrageous, and divisive speech I have ever seen from an American president. I apologize if I'm not really selling the Ben Shapiro thing. Imagine that I've slowed it down by about two times. Joe Biden essentially declared all those who oppose him and his agenda enemies of the republic. Truly shameful. No, he didn't do that, and you know he didn't do that because you said essentially. And the reason you wrote essentially in your tweet is because you know that Donald Trump literally called groups in America the enemy of the people hundreds of times, and you never raised a single objection to it. Thus, the flaccid essentially in your tweet. But Donald Trump also posted about it, not on Twitter because he's not allowed on there, and that remains fun to this day, saying, if you look at the words and meaning of the awkward and angry Biden speech tonight, he threatened America, including with the possible use of military force. He must be insane or suffering from late stage dementia, and might I add, person, woman, man, camera, TV. Uh, yes, he was threatening with military force. I mean, come on, Are, do we seriously have to respond to whether Biden was threatening to deploy the military against the American people, that isn't actually what he was doing. Now, Donald Trump frequently fantasized about putting the military in the streets, whether for ostentatious North Korean esque military parades or to crush social justice protests. Again, it is all projection, undiluted. <sighs> Dark yeah. Jackson. Yeah. Oh, we so, have a Jackson here. <laughs> so what what I'm seeing from all the right wing is them basically saying, how dare they fight back? Don't they know their place? They're supposed to just have us pummel them and just sit there and take it and tell America how great we are. <laughs> no, sorry. For the first time, Joe Biden hasn't done that. That's what he normally does. But he gave a speech that went a quarter of the way to being honest. And guys, look, when we talk about threat to democracy, so look, a couple of the commentators there that you saw with your own eyes, and then Donald Trump talked about a call that Biden was doing a call to war and and he threatened to use military force. Did he actually say any of that in the speech? Absolutely not, you can watch the speech for yourself, you see that. There's none of it, it's just totally made up. But it is what we talked about earlier, it is projection. Right, so they want Donald Trump literally said, "Go down to the Capitol." Uh, he, you know, when he heard that the, his own vice president might be murdered, he said he didn't mind. So there's been a literal call to violence from Trump over and over and over again. Lindsey Graham talking about how there's going to be riots in the streets if you dare hold Trump accountable, etc. They're obviously projecting. And did we always say that Donald Trump was a threat to democracy? Like that we say it to, to John's point. That we say without substance, just like they say it without substance, absolutely not. Go back and see during the 2016 election when I definitely, definitely wanted Trump to lose. And I did a hundred loser Donald segments. Did I ever say that he was a threat to democracy? No, you know why? Because at that point, I didn't know he was a threat to democracy. I just thought he was an incompetent, evil, stupid, immoral guy, okay? That shouldn't be anywhere near power. But I didn't think he was gonna, he wasn't gonna leave office, that he was gonna ask his, uh, crowd to do a riot, maybe hang his vice. I didn't think any of that because I hadn't seen an inclination towards that. Now we see it, so you actually point out facts. Facts matter, they matter. But CNN will tell you now because they have a new Republican owner, a 50-50, I can't tell. And in fact, they did do that. Several different people today on CNN talking about, oh, Biden's gone too far. He's such a meanie, I can't believe he's doing that. So it's absolutely absurd. And, uh, and and the talk about enemies of the state, they're kind of rubbing it in your face that they're liars. So both Trump and, and Stephen Miller, you talking about, especially Stephen Miller in that clip that you saw, he knows, he wrote the lines about Democrats and media being enemies of the state when he was writing for Donald Trump. So he goes on there and winks to the, to the people who know, but he knows the audience doesn't know anything because they've been brainwashed by right wing media and they don't know a goddamn thing. So he goes, oh, Biden is calling for his opponents to be enemies of the state, wink. Oh, That is so bad, wink. I <laughs> can't believe they're offending your feelings, wink. But the audience doesn't know he's winking, they really think because yes. this is the only thing they're seeing. If you watch Tucker Carlson's segment, remember his entire audience is 100% brainwashed. You would have thought that it was Hitler's speech and that Biden was saying, I'm going to come. And he said, he made it seem like they were, the Biden was gonna send soldiers to your house. 
and maybe even attack you, physically attack you. you, you they, they think that Biden's about to march in the goddamn streets with the military. And by the way, what happens at the end of right wingers thinking that? They grab their guns. Super last thing, I would say comparatively globally, Americans have been pretty comfortable. We haven't had relative political instability. And the idea that we could become the kind of country where democracy fails and we are terribly politically unstable to the point that there's violence in the streets scares a lot of Americans. Not only that, Joe Biden in this speech pointed out how the right has taken many of our basic rights and freedoms away via their control of the Supreme Court. And so what mainstream media, especially Fox, is trying to do here is get people to not watch the speech because they don't want people to hear those narratives. They are afraid. But I think it could backfire because they're saying all of this crazy stuff about what happened in the speech, but the clips don't reflect any of that crazy stuff happening. So they're effectively teasing the speech and more people might end up actually tuning into the speech because of it. Yeah, that's also true. Yes, um, it's super last thing. Tucker Carlson also told you that the uh, the people at the George Floyd protests were gonna march into your house and pull you out of your beds. He said the same thing effectively about the like mandatory vaccination squads that were gonna come out. They just keep saying it and they keep gobbling it up. It's weird how that works. Okay, with that said, why don't we? Ah, oh, okay, okay. We're gonna take a break. We come back though. Uh, low key, one of the most important bits of political news, a development uh, coming out of the raid of Mar a Lago. We'll give you all the details after this. Back on TYT, Jenk, John, and Jessica with you guys. But also, uh, who do we got? Nico Juiced and David Hughes just became members. So uh, are they American heroes? I guess. No, I don't even guess. I'm sure they are. They hit the join button below the video on YouTube. You can do likewise, tyt.com slash join. Be part of the honest reporting, bringing truth to the country. John. Let's do it. Okay, let's jump into some fun news. <clears throat> The FBI raid of Mar-a-Lago turned up literally hundreds of classified documents. You know that by now, and that is important because that's evidence of many crimes that Trump knowingly committed, considering that those documents remained in Mar-a-Lago following multiple conversations he had with groups dispatched to recover them. But it turns out that what they didn't find might actually be spicier. Take a look at what was revealed when a judge uncovered more of the inventory of what they found during the raid. This graphic is telling. It catalogs the, con the contents of item number two, which is a box from Trump's office. And what it shows is that there were 43 empty folders that were marked classified. Do you get what that means? That means that there were dozens and dozens of folders that contained classified documents that now do not contain classified documents. And it is possible conceivable that some of those documents were taken out and put elsewhere, put into the storage room, thrown on the floor, God only knows, put in his mouth, chewed up, spit into the toilet, I don't know. But it's also possible that there had been documents in those many, many folders and they were taken out and they were put somewhere. We don't know where necessarily. Some of them might have been recovered, but we don't know for sure. And so it is possible that there are many more classified documents remaining outstanding, either at Mar-a-Lago or some other Trump property. And I know that along the way, they've unveiled little bits of information about this investigation. I would really love an update on what they think about the contents of those folders. Yeah, well, I, I'm gonna layer one on top of that, John, and I'm a little afraid to do it. but. Uh, I'll do that in a second. But first, um, imagine if a Democrat had taken classified secrets home in a file labeled classified or top secret. And then they wouldn't give it back, wouldn't give it back, even though the government was saying that is our top secrets. You must give the national secrets back. And the Democrat, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Hunter Biden, you name, name a person they hate, right? Michelle Obama for no reason. And she's like, no, I'm not giving the national secrets back. Yeah, when we were in the White House, I took them. So what? And then the FBI is forced to raid her home and they find a lot of the top secret stuff that we had that was totally unguarded. And God knows why 
she took it in that weird analogy where I'm saying it's Michelle Obama, right? And then some of the nuclear secrets are missing. Well, I don't know if those particular classified documents are the nuclear secrets, but certainly classified there are 48 folders of classified documents are missing. What would the Republican reaction? Their heads would explode. She's selling them, we knew it, traitors, <laughs> right? If it was Hunter Biden, Michelle Obama, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, it doesn't matter. They would lose their minds. And right now they would have the gallows ready. They'd be talking about hanging them, killing them, butchering them, etc. Trump does it, they're like, no, you're supposed to take the classified secrets and then hide them and never give the government and maybe give it to our enemies because that's what a patriot would do. There is no talking sense to Republicans. All of them have lost their minds. If you were in, if you were 1% fair or objective here, you would say, what the, <laughs> why are there still missing classified documents? You lunatic, give them back, you moron, you goddamn criminal, give them back, okay? So John, the, the part that I can layer on that is I'm a little dangerous, uh, it's a little dangerous, I'm afraid to do it, is he, it, Trump also says, yeah, it doesn't matter, I declassified all of them. And Bill Barr today was saying, if he did that, that's even more dangerous. Because it, Republicans, if you really believe he declassified them, can anybody that's seen them in the American government, left or right, just start publishing them on the internet if they're declassified? Hmm. That You don't want that. Nobody wants that, and that makes us super clear. No, they're not declassified. The, the guy's an obvious freaking liar. But I'm afraid to say it because now the right wing might think, who cares? Put the nuclear secrets online. Ha <laughs> ha, we trolled them. Listen, I don't know a lot about the protocols for what happens when a former leader steals classified documents, <laughs> but I don't think the FBI does either. I don't know why we're in the midterms. Donald Trump left the White House a long time ago. Why did it take so long for people to notice they're missing? This should have been a problem a long time before now. That's very concerning. Trump had plenty of time to share these documents out with the many foreign nationals who come through Mar-a-Lago. He could have used a copy machine. We're in a modern era, not <gasps> hard to do that. He could have handed them out to his buddies. And let's be honest, uh, there are a lot of people in the international arena who are not big fans of the United States because we really haven't been the nicest guy to other countries abroad. And they might wanna use this classified information, especially nuclear secrets against us. This is a huge problem and I have no idea why it took us until the point that the documents are missing, not in their folders lost, to actually raid Mar-a-Lago to get them back. Yep. I wonder what we're going to find out. Did they recover them? Are they in New York? Are they in Trump Tower? Are they buried in a golf course somewhere? Highly suspicious. In his wallet. In his wallet, exactly. I mean, yeah, he could have copied them. He could start truthing yeah. them out at any moment. Yeah. Look, guys, we, we're, everybody's ignoring the elephant in the room because the media is so afraid of saying it and they're gonna get attacked by the right wing endlessly. The most likely answer is he was trying to sell them. And that actually does make him a traitor. I, don't know, I, I, I I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure about that. I think it is possible that he just cares so little about it that he wants it, it's mine, I'll have it. Even if he didn't intend to give it out. Uh, so we, we defer a little bit there, but. Uh, no, but John, I'm not entirely sure either. But if you think a guy obsessed with money who thinks he's above the law wouldn't consider selling them, you don't know Donald Trump. That's true, that's true. Well, either way, the crime is the same, regardless of what his motivation was, the crime is the same. Okay, with that said, well, I suppose there could be additional crimes if he was selling them abroad. But anyway, for now, why don't we move on to a fun topic to close out this first hour. One man on Reddit is apparently facing a bit of a dilemma when it comes to the future of his relationship and the obstacle between him and his girlfriend. And it centers on 
her finances. He shared his story on Reddit and here is a bit of that. He says, I've been in a relationship for nearly three years. I'm 31, my partner is 25. I've recently started to look at where things are going for us. If we take the next step and I started to get a little fearful. I have absolutely no debt, cars paid off and make $85,000 a year, medical field, with an emergency fund and about 25K in investments. I have worked extremely hard to get to the position I am in so I can eventually provide for a family and chase financial dreams like owning rental properties, etc. Very specific, but there is a problem. His girlfriend has $220,000 in student loan debt and $2,000 in credit card debt. She's currently in school and expects to make 75K a year and pay $2,500 a month in loans for a decade after she graduates. So all that being true, according to him, he says, I truly love this girl. She has so many qualities I never thought I would find in a partner. But this debt is something that I feel will really hinder the quality of my life due to the fact that with those monthly payments, she basically won't be able to save any money at all for 10 years. He adds, I should note that I'm a specialist in my field, medical, and should see my income increase over the next few years to around 110K to 125K. And there was a bit of a split in terms of the comments about what he should do, but there were many who felt like this is a good reason to leave your partner. You might like them, you might have a good relationship, but that is simply too big of a barrier. You should cut the rope. What do you both think? Okay, I'm super curious what Jessica thinks. I'm also super curious what you guys think. Um, because I'm old school on this. Uh, and so um, I really wonder uh, how different our opinions might be. Anyways, that's why we're doing a poll. Whenever we we're not sure, we do the poll. Uh, should you base your decision of marriage on how much debt uh, your partner has? Yes or no, tyt.com slash polls. Uh, we'll always put the polls and petitions in the description box below. If you're watching later on YouTube or Facebook, make sure you click that, it's super easy. Okay, now, um, my opinion is, wow. Uh, first, let's note that we're in late stage capitalism. <laughs> uh, when people are making decisions uh, based on how much debt they have accrued under corporate rule. Um, but uh, in terms of should they, no, the old school way of thinking is, no, that's outrageous. You should, if you like your partner and you love your partner and you guys get along great, you'll work it out together. Really, you're gonna dump someone because they have student debt? I, I'm actually stunned by that. Yeah, I, I agree with Jake, I am also stunned by it. Can you imagine this origin story getting broken up with this this way? I love you, but I really want to be a landlord. She's going to be an <laughs> ins unstoppable organizer. I cannot imagine what she would do next. But it's sad that economic hardship is such a strain on love and relationships in our society. It's definitely late stage capitalism. And it's just sad. But if material conditions are determining the relationship, did you really love them in the first place? Maybe not. I think what we're experiencing here is very few people do real love anymore. A lot of people that I meet are caught up in the idea of being in a thing, getting into a relationship. A lot of people are in relationships and then they post it all on social media and then you talk to them in person and they're terribly unhappy. Uh, in Sweden, there's really interesting research about people getting married. Uh, at lower rates when they remove the tax benefit of getting married. And so I think it's a, a problem that love is dying and I'm gonna blame capitalism. Exactly, yeah, think about it. <laughs> Brandon had a chance to save love in America, but what is $10,000 gonna do for this woman? Maybe 20K, I don't know if she's got Pell Grants, I'll have to search on Reddit. But yeah, for someone like that, uh, it doesn't seem like that much uh, relief, um, I think. That if you were to poll people honestly, not have them self report, but actually tap into their brain, and I'm in favor of the government doing that, then I think a lot of people would actually heavily consider this. But but I would say for at least a couple of reasons, it isn't necessarily wise. Partially because like you're planning for your rental properties. Have you looked at the world around us? How much longer do you think this thing is gonna go? Just pick someone you like hanging out with and ride out the last couple of years until we're all searching for like spooled copper wire and, and water and, and halves of old discarded protein bars. Like the debt's not gonna count for anything when the when civilization falls. So you've got that to look forward to. But also, like it is a financial obstacle, it is. But you're almost certainly gonna face those anyway. Like think about how common medical bankruptcy is. We're all just a couple more years of jack in the box from $200,000 in medical debt. 
you at least have the comfort of already knowing what the major financial albatross around your neck is. Instead of, I don't know, like going underwater on your rental property or whatever. I think it's a safe bet if you actually like this person, that is rare enough, that's valuable. It might even be worth a couple hundred thousand dollars. I like what John points out here. Don't you want someone to love while the world is smoldering around us? <laughs> it's so romantic. But it's interesting. Jake and I both say like it's old school to believe in real love and forget about, you know, the material conditions of the relationship. If you really love them, be with them. But actually, is that a new thing? Because I know that for many, many years, marriage was an economic arrangement, right? There are a lot of arranged yeah. mar marriages. It's super traditional. And the nuclear family structure was definitely something that was pushed for the benefit of work structures and capitalism. So maybe love is the future, actually. Okay, first of all, I like that John is being called smoldering in some weird way that he started. Uh, okay, it's stick and it's now because I'm gonna put it on Twitter bio. Thing. <laughs> in fact, one of our members on Twitch, Cody the Epilepsy Dragon, wrote in, is it just me or is Johnny Pie being seductive by having an extra button undone? Is it, no, if this is- want to know, John. Uh, I have to fact check you, this is not an extra button. This would be an extra, but no, I'm kidding. I'm not. Gonna do that. <laughs> we don't have time. We don't have time for you to process what don't you'd do say. It, don't do it, brother. Don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. I don't want to make you do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't make me. Okay. So, but last thing, guys. Look, I know that money matters. Of course, we all know that money matters, and it's at the very least in the back of our minds, and we think about it subconsciously. That's why when you have tax incentives, it does move the numbers. It sucks that it moves the numbers, but it does, right? I think what I was surprised by was how cold the guy was. Like he's like, I did the math on it and I looked, put it on a spreadsheet. I put a pin in it and I circled back to it later and realized the numbers just aren't matching up here. So I've got to let her go, right? And then, okay, so that's one dude, right? But the crowd reaction of like, dump her, dump her, right? Because she has too much debt as if it was her fault. Mm -hmm. That's what I was surprised by. And I hope that's not a phenomenon that's catching on. And and if it is, I, I think it's probably a sad indictment yeah. of, of our current society. I agree, although let's not be too hard on the guy. Like he at least required her to pass $200,000 in debt before he's ready to cut loose. Leonardo DiCaprio, like once you're, you're aged enough that you can rent a car, that's all it takes. No debt necessary, even if you could afford the car, you're gone. Yep. Anyway. Will Dark Brandon save love and keep his campaign promise of canceling student loan debt? Stay tuned. <laughs> we'll see. Oh my God, you're right. Joe Biden could save this marriage. Joe, you got to do it now. <laughs> Cancel all the debt. <laughs> Let him go. <laughs> you know, by the way, if that became a national story about whether these guys were going to get married or not, it would totally affect the country in whether they wanted to cancel all student debt or not. Oh, let's People it. are funny creatures. We should almost try. Yeah, we should. That's all, all right, the time we have. We are, we're out of time and we're out of comments talking about John's looks. So okay, I've had enough, we're gonna move on. All right, everybody check out Jessica on Rebel Headquarters. She's doing amazing videos there, you guys will love those. Uh, John's, of course, the legendary host of the Damage Report and the father of all dragons. Okay, so everybody check out Damage Report. Now, by the way, starting in October, it's gonna go Damage Report, Indisputable, on Boss with Nina Turner, back to back to back. It's gonna be awesome, okay? And the watch uh, list, Jank. And the watch list. And that's list. true, it starts with the watch list and then goes to the Damage Report. What a squad, what a lineup. I love it. Okay, everybody check that out. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.